Good morning and welcome to Together in God, a media ministry of Grace and University Lutheran Churches of the ELCA. We are excited to share with you God's message of love and hope for all. For more information, see our websites. Please join us now in worship. Good morning. Welcome to worship. On behalf of Grace Lutheran and University Lutheran Churches, we are glad that you are here today. Today our lessons and our sermon will be focusing on forgiveness, that hard but essential thing that we are called to as people of God. Thank you for joining us for worship today.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O Lord God, merciful judge, you are the inexhaustible fountain of forgiveness. Replace our hearts of stone with hearts that love and adore you, that we may delight in doing your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The first lesson is from the 50th chapter of Genesis. Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers said, What if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did to him? So they approached Joseph, saying, Your father gave us this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now, therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept, fell down before him, and said, We are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good, in order to preserve a numerous people as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and for your little ones. In this way, he reassured them speaking kindly to them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 18th chapter. Then Peter came to Jesus and said, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of God can be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and his children and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me and I'll pay everything. And out of pity, the Lord of the slave released him and forgave him the debt. But the same slave, as he came out, came upon one of his fellow slaves, who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then this fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him in prison until he could pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they came and reported it to their Lord, all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave! I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as, as I had mercy on you? And in his anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he could pay the entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or your sister from your heart. This is the Gospel of the Lord. There's so much to try to unpack in this story. And after meeting with our members in our Wednesday text study, there's even more that we found questionable, troubling, confusing. I don't get a story that ends with torture as this one does. And I find it hard to learn from stories that assume master and slave relationships are just the way things are. But there are some things that I learned as I've studied about this text. The debt that the first slave has forgiven is unbelievably high. So, if you remember the story, there's two debts. One slave owes another slave a hundred denarii. And that first slave owes his master 10,000 talents. A denarii is a typical day's wage in Jesus' day. So the second slave owes the first 100 days' wages. If we try to convert that in today's terms with minimum wage, it would be something like, I don't know, $12,000. And that sounds like a lot of money for a slave. No wonder the slave wanted it paid back. But here's the thing. We need to convert not only 100 denarii, but 10,000 talents, the amount the first slave owed his master. And when we do that, it amounts to four billion, with a B, billion dollars. I don't even know how a slave accumulates that much debt, if that's even possible. But even more, what would it be like to have an insurmountable debt? You owe somebody four billion dollars, and then have them wave it away as though it never had existed. If that kind of forgiveness is offered, wouldn't it just change everything? 
kingdom of heaven is like having a $4 billion debt canceled. Hmm. Let's think about some of the things I do understand in this text and move into them. I know that when I live in relation with others, without remembering the utter graciousness and mercy of God, I end up torturing even myself. When I'm more interested in defending my own honor or revisiting resentments than I am in practicing mercy for another, I have not entered in the kingdom of heaven that Jesus offers. Second, I believe Jesus is inviting Peter into relationships with others that don't manage or keep tracks, keep count of rights and wrongs, but tries to view everything in light of God's generosity and mercy. I imagine Jesus saying to Peter, 77 times you should forgive, and Peter saying, I could, how could I even keep track? And Jesus saying, exactly. Keeping track is not the point. It might be that Jesus is saying uh, that people in the church may keep hurting G Peter, and every time they hurt Peter, he should come back and forgive them again. But another way of reading it is that Jesus is being clear that forgiveness is hard to practice. In my own life, when I have felt most hurt by another, any forgiveness I come up with is not a, a one-and-done deal. It's a long, difficult process. Sometimes, for one thing done to us, learning to let go is something we need to practice again, and again. Seventy-seven times, even, before our letting go lets the hurt go for us and lets us go on to the next good thing that God has prepared. Even in terms of offering ourselves forgiveness, it can be this difficult. You shake loose what you did and find yourself snagged in it again the next day. How could I have done that? You may have to allow yourself forgiveness, not once or twice, but 77 times. Also, this I clearly know. We indeed struggle to understand forgiveness and put it into practice. But for Jesus, forgiveness defines who he is from beginning to end. His words in this story may perplex me, but his actions throughout his life make this clear. He is all about forgiveness. In this text, Peter struggles to understand what Jesus is teaching him. But I suspect that Peter began to understand after he betrayed Jesus and abandoned him in Jesus' greatest hour of need. Then Peter understood the weight of the debt he carried. And three days later, when the resurrected Jesus came to meet him, he understood what that the same Jesus whom he had betrayed shows up not in anger but with compassion, forgiving him so that they can begin again. If being complicit in the death of Jesus in his hour of greatest need is something Jesus willingly forgives Peter for, and there's hope for us all. Jesus returns again and again in the face of our betrayal and abandonment of him in order to move us out of self-instigated torture and into new life. Jesus returns to us again and again in our brokenness, 77 times, 4 billion times, if that's what it takes, so that we may be taken up and into the life that God offers us. I have the privilege today, on behalf of Jesus, to say this true thing. Brother, sister, all your sins are forgiven for Jesus' sake. Amen.
With the whole church, let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the people of God in Christ Jesus, and for all according to their need. God of grace, you forgive us over and over again for what we do and fail to do, for who we are and who we are not. May we receive forgiveness with grace and humility. Give us the courage and trust to be able to forgive others, setting us free from the way sin binds us together. We receive your grace. Teach us to give it generously. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for this earth and all the ways it is suffering and all those who suffer in its wake. Wildfire and smoke-filled air, hurricane and flooding, tornado and wind, drought and heat, ice and cold. We repent of the ways we contribute to depleting the earth and pray for healing and restoration of the natural world, that life may thrive. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for justice and safety for all who live in fear because of who you have made them to be. For those who are targeted with violence because they are black. For those who are threatened with deportation because they speak Spanish. For those who endure harassment and assault because they are queer, transgender, or female. And for those who are mistrusted because of their religion. We pray that your spirit will empower us to work to change our communities that allow some of your beloved children to suffer, that we will join our lives with theirs for safety and for joy. Lord, in your mercy, hear yeah. our prayer. We pray for our government in this election season, for discernment as we vote, for dedication to the greater good, for reparation of the deep divisions that continue to be fostered by political parties, for more questions and conversations leading to understanding, and for fair elections upholding the democracy that founded this nation. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. We pray for students of all ages, their teachers, professors, staff, and parents, all who are navigating difficult times for education and activities. Give them peace and bless their technology. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. We pray for all who are sick or suffering from COVID or other ailments of body, mind, or spirit, that they will get the care they need and return to health. We pray also for all who are caregivers in hospitals, assisted living centers, clinics, and homes, grateful for their dedication to the good health and well-being of our communities. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O God, we commend all for which we pray, trusting in your mercy, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Thank you for being part of our Together in God worship service. Your prayers and financial support are always deeply appreciated. Go in peace. Serve the Lord.